Good morning or uh, good evening to wherever you are in the world and welcome uh, to this virtual flash panel hosted by the Nanavik Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame called the German elections four weeks later. Um, my name is Moritz Greffrath. I'm a PhD candidate in political science here at the University of Notre Dame, a graduate fellow with the Notre Dame International Security Center and co-editor of the Europe in the World project here at the Nanavik Institute. Um, as you likely all know, roughly a month ago, Germany had one of the most anticipated elections in recent years. Uh, Angela Merkel, after 16 years in office as chancellor, had long announced that she would not run again, meaning that Germany would for the first time in a long time be led by someone else. Uh, in the months prior to the election, the polls appeared to be quite volatile with several different parties pulling ahead and falling behind over and over again. And when the election actually happened, Merkel's Christian Democrats sustained losses of almost nine percentage points, while both the Social Democrats and the Greens both gained over five percentage points. As of now, Social Democrats, Greens, and the Liberal FDP party, the so-called traffic light coalition, uh, due to the party's choice of color, red, green, and yellow respectively, are in coalition negotiations to form a new government, the success of which is anticipated by many, but not guaranteed. So as is likely clear by now at least, there is much to be analyzed here, both in terms of the election results and current efforts to form a government, but maybe even more importantly so in terms of what all of this means for the future of Germany, Europe, and maybe even the world at large. Um, this is why I'm so glad to introduce to you a set of three exceptional panelists today that will help us shed light on these questions over the coming hour. Each of them, which I will introduce in a second, will take up to nine or 10 minutes at most in the beginning to share with us what they think are some of the most notable developments and important insights regarding the election and its implications. Thereafter, we will go into a QA. and uh, I have questions prepared for all our panelists, but want to stress that the virtual audience is very encouraged to make use of the Q&A function here on Zoom to submit their questions to our panelists, and I will weave them in into the discussion as appropriate. Um, so let me uh, begin by introducing our panelists in the order in which they will make their opening remarks. First off is Dr. Sabrina Meyer. Dr. Meyer is the head of data and methods at the German Center for Integration and Migration Research and a senior research fellow at the Department of Political Science at the University of Duisburg-Essen. She holds an MA in political science, computer science and accounting from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, where she also earned her PhD in political science. Her research, which follows the paradigm of theoretically based empirical research, focuses on political psychology, Political, in, political integration of societal subgroups, research method, and science studies. She's specifically interested in and well known for her work on issues of group identities, political attitudes, and comparative electoral behavior. And her work has appeared in countless prestigious academic journals, including the British Journal of Political Science and Political Psychology. And her research has been widely featured in television and newspapers across the world. Um, welcome, Dr. Meyer. Um, second of all, we have Dr. Ulrike Franke, uh, Dr. Franke is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, where she leads the Technology and European Power Initiative. She is also a policy affiliate at the Governance of Artificial Intelligence Project at the Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, she holds a BA from Science Po Paris, a double summa cum laude MA degree from Science Po and the University of St. Gallen, and a PhD in International Relations from the University of Oxford. Her dissertation received the prestigious John McCain Dissertation Prize, which is issued yearly by the Munich Security Conference for Exceptional Academic Work on Transatlantic Relations. And her academic and policy work focuses, among other issues, on German and European security and defense, the future of warfare, and the impact of new technologies like drones and IAI on international politics. Her work has appeared in several publications, including the newspapers Die Zeit and FAZ, as well as prestigious outlets such as War on the Rocks, or the Zeitschrift für Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik. Finally, and this is a personal recommendation, she also co-hosts the Sicherheitshalber podcast, which is a highly recommended German language podcast on security and defense. Welcome, Dr. Franke, uh, to the panel. Finally, and last but not least, we have Professor Vittorio Hösle, who is the Paul Kimball Professor of Arts and Letters in the Department of German and Russian Languages and Literatures and concurrent Professor of Philosophy and of Political Science here at the University of Notre Dame. He is also the founding director of the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. His scholarly interests are in the areas of systematic philosophy and history of philosophy. And Professor Hursley is the author of more than 50 books, which have appeared in over 20 languages, including most recently, Globale Fliehkräfte, or Global Centrifugal Forces, in which he critically assesses recent developments in world politics, including right-wing populism and transatlantic relations during the Trump era. Among his many other prizes and awards, he received the Fritz Winter Prize of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, 
and has had visiting professorships in many countries and fellowships at various institutions, such as the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. With that being said, welcome to all three of you. We're so honored to have you here with us. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Meyer for her opening remarks. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to share some slides and let's see if it works again. Can you see that? Okay, perfect. So um, when I was asked to give some takeaway points from the election, um, first I had some problems finding them because, well, it was in some sort some exceptional election because, well, Angela Merkel was not uh, eligible anymore. But apart from that, it felt rather underwhelming. So, um, but when I went again um, over the data and thought, well, what's probably one of the, the major things, I actually found three things that are quite interesting and intriguing and which I want to share and discuss with you. So first, I was um, quite amazed in hindsight that the FDP still is not dead and actually it managed to um, revive itself quite successfully. So when I started my PhD um, in the early 2010s, um, the FDP or the Liberals were a party that were almost vanishing from the political screen. Um, when I wrote my um, PhD thesis, I even thought about excluding them because they were below the 5% threshold, they did not enter parliament, and it felt like they were finished from a political point of view. But somehow they managed, like in, in the last election, to um, enter parliament again, but when they had the opportunity to probably enter a governing coalition, well, they declined and said, no, we just want to work from the point of the opposition. And a lot of people said, well, that's probably a bad decision because while well, you're missing the spotlight and the chance to attract more voters. But if, if you look at the current results of, of the current election, it's, it's quite surprising, A, that they um, well, gained a bit again, and B, which is um, one of the things I found most interesting, that they especially gained among young voters. So um, the FDP was alongside with the Greens, one of the parties that attracted the crowd of first-time voters aged 18 to 24 the most, which was quite interesting because when, when you look at media reports running up to the election, a lot of people focused on the Greens and Fridays for Future and the new environmental conscientiousness among this group, but not many people actually talked about the liberals and their appeal. And I um, have some data from Saxony, well, a state in, in the former East, which is um, one of the first states to release their representative election statistics yet. And you can clearly see if you look at um, party shares among the young voters, the crowd um, aged age, well, 24 and, and under, and the, the more, more gray voters, which was aged 17 and above, you see clearly that the liberals have a specific appeal to, to the young voters group. And if, if you look at the differences between uh, women and men, you see that they especially appeal to um, male vot voters. And this is a phenomenon we saw uh, uh, for a lot of different um, states and different subgroups of the population, especially if you look at immigrant origin voters, even here the FDP, um, has gained a, a, a lot of attention because I think they offer some sort of hedonistic worldview, a view where everybody gets the feeling that they can make it, that they can be one of the smooth and successful people in the world. And I think this is quite interesting to see how the FDP went from being one of the major political losers and um, now again to, to one of the parties that are at the pulse of time and, and very popular now with, with the younger crowd. What I find also quite interesting to see that the AFD, the um, right populist party, has somehow come to stay, but mostly in the former East, the former GDR. So if you look at um, second vote shares for the alternative for Germany, the AFD, you see for the um, five Eastern German states that shares are exceptionally high. But if you look at, um, at the Western states, you see that there's quite some sort of divide. And we will talk about this later on, what this means and what probably, probably reasons for this are. But I think um, this means um, also one thing, that the AFD is successfully in implementing itself in the East and establishing structures 
which um, probably are quite helpful to stay relevant for a long time, but um, things might be different in, in the form of it. And last, I, while well, this is my specific topic, I was wondering that immigrant origin voters were rarely analyzed in the election campaign, because nowadays up to 12% of, of the electorate have some sort of migrant background, so they were born abroad or their parents were born abroad. And you could probably think that this group might matter, well, because 12% still is, is, is quite a, a large number. But um, apart from some, some minor parties, um, the, I would say the bigger, bigger parties refrain from specifically addressing this group of um, specific policies or specific programs, etc. Um, now I share some views of Berlin with you um, because I'm quite interested in um, foreign language election posters. And there were only a few parties, especially in those electoral districts with high number of immigrants. This, um, these examples come from, from where I live, Berlin, Neukölln. And you see that um, some parties, especially from the left side, made the effort to translate their election posters, not because the immigrant origin voters do not speak German. Usually you have to prove your fluency in German to, to get citizenship at least. But this is some sort of valuation, some sort of signaling that um, they are accepted as they are being bilingual or having even more languages. And we also see here um, some um, candidate from the SPD who translated all their election posters into Arabic and Turkish, for example. But um, apart from this um, anecdotal um, posters, there was no um, systemic strategy by none of the parties to attract this rather large group, and I still wonder why. I would say this is, this is from, from my remarks. Excellent. Thank you so much. This will be, we'll, we'll pick up on all these topics, hopefully much more in the discussion section, uh, in the discussion part of the, uh, of the talk today. Uh, Dr. Franke, I think uh, you're up next. Thank you so much, Moritz, for the introduction and a wonderful good evening in my case um, from me from Brussels, where the sun is just about setting. Um, and uh, I've had a bunch of interesting conversations uh, over the last week in Brussels, where everyone is quite interested in, you know, what's the next uh, coalition government uh, going to do and, and look like. And, and so there, there are quite a few discussions on, on that here as well. Um, as Moritz mentioned, I primarily work on German foreign and defense policy. Uh, nevertheless, I thought I'll start with um, three very short key takeaways um, that are a bit more general and I think complement Sabrina's points quite nicely because they touch upon the same issues. And then I do three, again, really short ones on uh, foreign and specifically defense policy. So first of all, the kind of more general points. Um, my first takeaway of this election actually was that the fringes lost. And I'm not contradict contradicting any um, of the data that Sabrina joined, but what we are seeing um, at the moment is that the two, what I would call the fringe parties, so the IFD alternative for Germany, which is the extreme right, and the Linke, which is the radical left, so the two parties at either side of the spectrum, they um, both lost votes, um, and together barely reached about 15%. Now, I would say 15% is still too much, but it is less than, than it used to be. So the IFD came out with just about, just over 10% of the votes, um, lost 2.3 percentage points, and the, the Linke came out with 4.9%, so lost 4.3 percentage point, which is quite a bit, so they almost half their, their vote share. Um, now, Again, the AfD, extreme right, I think 10% is still um, too much. And as Sabrina pointed out, they actually gained most votes or rather came out first in two lender and two bonus lender in the, in the East. So that's certainly concerning, but still, you know, um, somewhat brighter picture, I would say, than four years ago. And the left, the Linke, um, they, they only got 4.9% of the votes, as I mentioned, which means that normally they shouldn't even enter parliament because in Germany we have this 5% threshold. They managed to just about get in with, the, with their full 4.9% um, uh, 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 result uh, because they won th three direct votes, uh, two in Berlin and one in, in an East German town of, of Leipzig. Um, and so there's kind of a special provision, so they get all full, you know, 4.9% of their 
their votes in parliament, but it, it's really quite, um, it, it almost didn't happen. Why did that happen? I mean, there are a number of reasons one could mention, but I think that the reason that the fringes didn't do so well this time is that when there are alternatives, real alternatives, people are less inclined to go to the kind of extremes. Um, and I think what we saw in this election really was a feeling that, you know, your vote really mattered. There were four parties that were really trying to, to get your votes. Um, over the last few elections, we sometimes had this impression that, you know, there's nothing other than Merkel. We know what's going to happen. And I think this kind of helped the rise of the fringes. We didn't have this this time. So that's a good sign. The second thing I would mention is that the AfD, the alternative for Germany, which last time, so four years ago, entered um, parliament for the for the first time, really kind of showed over the last four years that they're not particularly good at and at at politics, I want to say. Um, they were quite divided and there were issues within the parties. So they didn't really show that they were a great party to vote for. And I think this explains this uh, result to some extent. So that was number one. Number two, I would say that this election has shown that Germany has moved a little bit towards the left. But there was a large world vote for continuity. So I'd say that on kind of domestic and especially social topics, um, Germany has moved a little bit to the left, or at least it really couldn't be captured by the kind of cultural wars that we see in other countries and that the CDU to some extent tried to, tried to start. I don't think this really um, appealed to the voters. But at the same time, we shouldn't make too much of the, the votes for the social democrats either, because I think the vote for the, the social democratic candidate for chancellor, um, Scholz, was very much a vote for continuity, definitely in style, because he kind of tried to say that, you know, he's a little bit like Merkel in style, um, but even also in, in content, because Scholz himself uh, is certainly uh, more towards the, the center of his party than, than other people in the, in the SP. Um, and the third larger point, which also Sabrina has touched upon, is the young. And I think um, the point I would make here is that the young voted for the smaller parties, so the FDP, the Liberals, um, and the Greens, as was mentioned. But the young don't really matter in Germany. And this is just the point I always mention because people sometimes forget the weird demographic structure that Germany has. So I wanted to, to kind of make sure that, that you are aware of. So um, actually, the, the SPD, the, the party that came out strongest, lost among the young, right? I mean, despite the fact that they won overall quite dramatically, they lost five percentage points among the 18 to 24-year-olds, two percentage points about among the 25 to 34-year-olds. So they really weren't popular with the young. And the reason is that the young voted for the smaller parties, the FDP and, and um, the Greens. So among the first time voters, uh, both of these parties get over 20%, which is quite impressive. The thing is, as happy as FDP and Greens can be about this, in Germany, the young don't really matter. And the reason is that there are very few young people in Germany. So when you, when you look at the numbers, uh, you see that less than 15% of the German electorate is under 30 years old, while 20% are over 70 years old, which means that well over half of German voters are over 50. And this just, you know, really skews elections and politics and, and I think really plays a role um, in, in the German mindset. And so something to, something I always like to uh, remind kind of foreign, um, uh, uh, foreign uh, listeners of. So these were three general points and equally short three points on foreign and defense uh, policy, which is something I specifically look at. The first point to make on that is that foreign and defense policy just didn't play a role in this election. I mean, it was really disheartening for me. I was watching these, you know, Triel TV um, uh, discussions between the three main candidates, and they just never touched upon foreign policy and defense policy. There was like one question on Afghanistan at one point, but that was pretty much it. And there was specifically by the Munich Security Conference, a panel organized um, on foreign policy, but it just, it really didn't gain, gain traction in the political um, campaign. And on the one end, you could say, I mean, what else is new? Germans and, I mean, electorates generally don't care that much about foreign policy, and Germans in particular don't care about defense policy. However, 
these topics actually matter quite a bit insofar as there were real differences between the parties, which we never got to discuss. And, and this is my second point on, on foreign and defense politics, um, foreign and defense policy actually will have to be a topic for the next government coalition. You know, you can't, you can't hide from, from foreign and defense policy, even if you want to. And I kind of want to say that the next coalition kind of wants to hide from it, but it won't be able to. Um, so that's my, that's my second point. Um, as you may know, we are looking in all likelihood at a traffic light coalition between the Social Democrats, the Liberals, the FDP, and the Greens. They're currently discussing this coalition and negotiation with this coalition, and it probably will come to pass. And so just very briefly, I want to give you a sense of what these parties stand for when it comes to foreign and, and defense policy. So the, the SPD, the big, the big party that, that won the election, um, what was really interesting is that they don't say that much on foreign policy. For example, in their election program, um, they had you know, only very few points on foreign policy, and this despite the fact that this was the party that had the, the German Foreign Office, or so the State Department equivalent, for the last eight years. Um, and I thought that, that was really quite, quite, um, quite striking. Part of the reason why they do this might be that within the party, you have relatively diverse views on foreign and especially defense policy. I'll get to this in a second. And so maybe they kind of just went for the lowest common denominator. But there's a bit of a question mark as to where they want to go. The Greens have an interesting kind of um, history of coming out of a peace movement, kind of pacifist movement. This has changed now, but it is still somewhat in their DNA which means that the Greens as a party are pretty skeptical when it comes to military and defense um, topics. I mean, they don't quite uh, want to abandon the Bundeswehr, but they're not you know, super keen on it either. But interestingly enough, they have relatively, I almost want to say hawkish views um, on, on some foreign policy topics, especially when it comes to kind of confronting larger powers on human rights issues. So they may address, uh, they may, they may um, approach China and Russia with a kind of human rights mindset and be a bit more hawkish towards them. This is similar among the FDP, which I would say, you know, on foreign defense policy is maybe a little bit of the outlier in this new coalition that we're going to see. However, the FDP is also quite concerned with the human rights abuses and, and these topics. So here they may agree with the, with the Greens. But I think the FDP of these three parties in the next coalition government is the one that is most kind of traditionally, let's say traditionally transatlantic and, and most, um, or it's like least skeptical when it comes to, to military uh, and defense topic, which is why to be very open with you, I kind of hope that the FDP will get to the defense ministry. Um, that's an open question at the moment. We'll see about this, but that's the kind of question that, that matter um, in in the current coalition um, negotiations. And to close, close off my remarks, um, I, I just want to kind of outline uh, the fact that, yes, so there, there will be a lot of topics that this new coalition will need to address on foreign and defense policy, even if they don't want to. And I think there are three that I'm looking at particularly. I mean, the world's big, so there are many, but, but three that I think are really worth watching. The first is the German slash European position towards China. No surprise there, right? But um, there is a real question as to how Germany and Europe should position itself towards China, especially with regard to the US positioning um, towards China, which is you know, pretty confrontational, not that much support, such a controversial, uh, confrontational position in, in Germany and Europe. Um, but, but there has been quite some movement in recent uh, years. And as I said, the Greens and the FDP may be more yeah, let's say hawkish, but it's hawkish in a German way. So, you know, don't get me wrong. That's the number. The first thing we can discuss, the second issue that's definitely going to be um, a topic for discussion is the question of NATO nuclear sharing. And we already see this uh, starting right now. Um, as you may know, Germany is part of NATO's nuclear sharing, which means that it has U.S. nuclear weapons based in Germany, which German airplanes are in theory, in a crisis, supposed to transport and 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 use, um, 
this has been going on for quite a long time and no one really touched upon it and, and, and wanted to touch it because it's certainly not popular among the German population. But the thing is that this next government will need to take a decision on, on nuclear sharing because the airplanes that are transporting these bombs are getting old and need to be replaced. And so we now have this really odd situation that this government, which I would say is kind of the least uh, positive towards the military in quite a while, may have to take a decision to spend millions, if not billions, on nuclear capable aircraft. And that's going to be an issue for SPD and green voters, and maybe they won't want to do it. And if that's actually where they want to go, um, that may have quite important repercussions on NATO. I can go into more detail if you want later on. But just to, to close this off, European defense would be the, the third point I am going to watch, because as you may know, the European Union has been much more active in the whole realm of European defense, um, partly this has partly to do with Trump, this has partly to do with Macron, a number of things, uh, but, but Germany will need to position itself on these questions, how much it supports defense being a bit of a bigger topic for the, for the EU. Um, and this is definitely something that, that Brussels is, is interested in and, and, and cares about and other member states care about. Um, so, so something to, to watch. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, let me remind the audience before we go to Professor Hürster that you can already think about and even submit your questions on any of these topics that we touched upon in these opening remarks for later in this session. Uh, with that being said, uh, Professor Vittorio Hürsler, uh, the stage is yours. Do you hear me? Yes, perfect. Good. Uh, so it's not easy for me uh, to speak after uh, such uh, two brilliant um, uh, presentations. So much has been said, um, and with most I agree. Let me add some, perhaps some um, uh, reflections on the uh, both the uh, results, uh, why they were in many aspects uh, not surprising, and on the uh, challenges ahead. Uh, first of all, this was one of the elections in the last years where the pollsters uh, were correct. Um, uh, there was no great surprise, unlike, for example, uh, in the presidential elections of the United States, both in 2016 and 2020. This, of course, has also to do with the fact that there is no direct election of a president. Uh, but in the whole, um, uh, it was pleasant to see that the um, uh, uh, academic authority of people like Dr. Sabrina Maya who works on empirical um, uh, um, a poll work uh, was uh, strengthened by the results of elections. Uh, the elections were not really surprising, uh, given um, uh, the anticipations of the uh, uh, polls, but they were also uh, not surprising, given uh, the mental state of the nation. It was quite clear that the candidate of the CDU did not have good chance after 16 years of Merkel people wanted to have some change and we'll see i agree with dr franke that the change was at the same time a change that maximized continuity um, but uh, um, after um, uh, 16 years of merkel uh, you would like to have the chancellery in the hand of another uh, a party. And the candidate uh, that had uh, gained uh, the um, leadership of its CDU, Achim Laschet, was simply a weak candidate. Um, I don't think that the CDU made a good decision with regard to him. This was, uh, um, uh, in fact, a scene early on. And when it came then to the um, uh, agreement between the CDU, which, as you know, is a party that uh, um, appears in all states except Bavaria, and the CSU that appears only in Bavaria, there's always a possibility that a candidate of the CSU may be put forward. This has happened twice in the history of the Federal Republic with Strauss and, of course, with Stoiber, um, and uh, both times not successfully. And the Bavarian a prime minister, um, a Söder, was not really much too late. He entered into um, um, the arena um, to challenge Laschet. He didn't do it um, with great conviction, even if uh, it is quite clear that According to the polls, he would have fared better for the Union than Laschet. 
and um, at the same time um, uh, 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 sort of behaved in my eyes unacceptably by showing great illoyalty towards Laschet uh, during the campaign. Again and again, making remarks that made clear that he didn't think that Laschet was a good candidate. Um, and this clearly contributed to a massive defeat um, of the um, Union. Um, uh, so this is the reason why I think the CDU um, lost the elections. The SPD won um, partly surprisingly because months ago at the beginning of 2021, the polls gave the Green Party as uh, leading. Um, and I think the reasons why the um, uh, 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 SPD uh, became the strongest party Partly is, as Dr. Franke was saying, the fact that the Germans are, even if they wanted after 16 years a change, also quite conservative. And voting for um, Olaf Scholz meant, after all, to have a man who has been vice chancellor um, in the last years be promoted to a chancellor. Uh, so there was a certain continuity guaranteed even in the change of the party because the chancellor of the SPD um, was uh, um, uh, clearly um, uh, very known to the um, uh, German public and his work under Merkel um, uh, was highly respected. And as I think you were right in saying, Dr. Franke, uh, the style that he um, uh, put forward uh, was in many aspects an imitation of Merkel's inflationary style. One of the reasons why Merkel was appreciated by the Germans is that she was not at all egomaniac. She was extremely um, a competent, diligent, um, uh, uh, nobody had ever thought that she could be corrupt. All this uh, um, uh, um, uh, clearly um, uh, uh, gained respect to both her and her vice chancellor. Another important factor for the victory of the uh, Social Democrats was that the party that often has been a problem for social democratic chancellors. Let's not forget that one of the reasons why uh, Helmut Schmidt in 1982 was voted out of office was that he didn't really um, um, uh, harmonize well with his own party and that has had a lot of uh, um, uh, party leaders uh, changed over the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, proved to be loyal. Even if Scholz did not make it to a position of the leader of the party, um, um, the uh, persons in the party understood that the only chance to avoid uh, radical decline of the SPD was to behave in a loyal way um, with regard to Scholz and hold back, for example, uh, people who are much more to the left uh, than Scholz is. Uh, whether this uh, peace will stay once uh, uh, Scholz is in the office of a chancellor remains to be seen. I'm not so sure about that, but certainly they had the strategic intelligence uh, uh, to hold back. And the third reason why the Greens did not make it is that I personally think that also here, uh, the party did not choose the right candidate. Um, Annalena Baerbock is certainly a nice uh, person, but she had no experience whatsoever in uh, um, any uh, public office. She has been in the Bundestag, I think, for eight years, but she was never um, uh, in an executive organ, not only at the federal level, not even at a state level, not even at, a le at the level of a town. Um, she was never vice mayor of a even small town. So she had no executive experience whatsoever. And of course, this could be easily turned against her when compared to the massive competence of Scholz, who had been governor of the uh, city uh, state of Hamburg and uh, had been vice chancellor and finance minister um, uh, um, for a long time. So I do think these are the three reasons why um, uh, the SPD um, uh, won the election. Concerning the AfD, I would, um, however, rather disagree with uh, Dr. Franke, uh, who said, well, they lost, yes, they lost 2%, but since the triumphant entry um, of the uh, um, uh, AfD in uh, 2017 was to a large amount caused by a lot of, uh, how shall I say, discontent of Germans with the uh, um, open policy towards immigrants in uh, 2015 by the government Merkel, it was natural that they would lose because the topic had lost its uh, um, the active, uh, uh, its, uh, its presence, and they lost far less than both Dr. Franke, Dr. Meyer, and I would have hoped. And the fact that in two of the German states, in Saxony and Thuringia, they became the strongest party 
is quite alarming. And I do think that uh, um, uh, Dr. Meyer was right. The IFD is here to stay. And I would go farther. She is here to stay not only in the East, because as we saw the statistics, in none of the states, in not one of the states, uh, the IFD got less than 5%. Um, and this means they will stay in the state parliaments uh, and I think uh, they will have uh, um, a longer uh, trajectory. Why is this so? Well, look, uh, I have really not the least sympathy for the IFD and for many of the ideas behind that. But I do think that the old conservatives in the CDU had a point when they said in my youth, I'm an old man, so my youth is in the 80s and 90s, we should not allow a party uh, right of the union party to form. And clearly one of the reasons why such a party formed was that Merkel was perceived by traditionally more conservative Germans and paradoxically by many conservative Germans in um, uh, uh, the new states uh, uh, from the former GDR, out of which Merkel herself came, um, it was perceived that the CDU had moved too much to the left. And uh, they don't identify that, uh, 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 with uh, this party anymore. And I myself uh, have heard in the last years again and again from acquaintances who are in Western Germany, doctors and lawyers, ich bin heimatlos geworden. I have lost my um, a political um, home country uh, with the uh, development of its CDU, and I must now seriously consider to vote for the AfD. And uh, this is a serious problem, and as the rise of the um, uh, Linke had for a large time threatened the SPD. So now the rise of IFD is threatening the um, CDU CSO in a quite dangerous way. Um, as we have seen, and this is certainly correct, uh, the link fortunately um, is uh, uh, strongly uh, diminished um, uh, only through this uh, um, uh, special law. They could enter um, the Bundestag, the federal parliament, um, uh, and I do not see how they will overcome their a crisis. It's clear that now a government with the Social Democrats uh, uh, that will uh, pass uh, a lot of uh, um, welfare laws will uh, decrease the appeal of the Linke even more. So I do not foresee a great future for the Linke. Well, I do think that the AfD will keep us busy um, in uh, um, a quite, um, a, a quite a long time. Now, the FDP also, um, uh, uh, by the way, the Greens also gained considerably. I mean, they were 9% in the last uh, Bundestag. Now they are 14%. So they increased, uh, um, uh, I think, more than 50%. But they did not get what they wanted uh, to go beyond 20%, which in many aspects was difficult from the start, but perhaps they could have come closer to the a, a, a goal if they had uh, um, run with uh, um, a Habeck instead of uh, um, a Baerbock as uh, a candidate for the uh, a chancel, uh, um, Chancellor's office. Um, the fact that the FDP uh, rebounds is interesting. It showed that, in fact, Linda's decision not to enter the government in 2017 was not stupid. Um, and it clearly increases now his bargaining power. Since he once, um, uh, at the end of the coalition um, uh, uh, bargain, said no, better nicht regieren als falsch regieren, better not to govern than to govern in a wrong way, people know that he could do this again, and probably it will give him more um, a bargaining power in the um, uh, um, uh, formation um, of a, a new government. Also here, an important factor for the um, uh, um, success of the FDP is, uh, uh, there are two reasons for this success. The one is that, again, the party was very, very um, strongly united uh, behind uh, um, uh, Lindner, the um, uh, uh, head um, of a um, liberal party. Uh, his leadership is not uh, um, uh, discussed by anybody. And the second aspect was that uh, um, uh, traditional um, uh, economy-oriented people uh, from the, um, the um, uh, bourgeoisie um, have perceived the CDU as being too much to the left. Uh, they are not uh, at all uh, conservative in social questions. Uh, they are not nationalistic. They are globalistically oriented, so they will certainly not vote for the AfD. And the FDP uh, corresponds uh, to um, a lot uh, um, of their ideas. Uh, so this, I think, are the reasons why the elections ended as they ended.
Now, what will be the problems of this government? I think that indeed the problems will be considerable. One, of course, is the taxation policy. Um, all these new um, social welfare programs have to be financed and the FDP um, doesn't want to raise the taxes. Uh, fortunately, our constitution has a limit on uh, the um, uh, possibility of public debt. Uh, so <coughs> this will be a very serious problem. And even if perhaps in the bargaining process, the problem um, that will be um, more or less uh, um, ignored, it will come to the fore in the next years, inevitably, uh, particularly if the FDP gets the finance ministry and then the finance minister has the right of veto um, uh, in the cabinet. It's the most important position after that of the chancellor. But the other problem is indeed, as Dr. Franke was saying, um, the uh, foreign and defense policy. And also here, um, I predict a lot of difficulties. Um, and the difficulties are, as uh, um, you were completely right, in saying not simply due to the uh, different ideas of the parties, but to the fact that the German nation in general doesn't want to speak about foreign policy and especially defense policy. There is an absolute refusal to think, for example, in geopolitical terms. And this has, of course, to a large amount to do uh, with the German um, uh, crimes um, uh, um, in the uh, Second World War, that people think military is bad, many people think it, and partly, however, with an almost bizarre refusal to see that the dangers, for example, that Russia poses to the European Union, to the Baltics, for example, um, uh, are very real, um, and nobody knows how the German population would um, react um, if, uh, um, uh, for example, there would be an attack against the Baltics uh, um, and uh, um, uh, in the Black Sea. I mean, uh, Stoltenberg last week warned, um, uh, mentioned that this is a possibility. The activities of Russia on both frontiers are worrisome, um, and we don't know how this will end. Uh, I'm not too optimistic that the German nation and the new government will be very able to address the issue. And I end now, um, where it's the last sentence, what is peculiar among the Greens is indeed that on the one hand, they're very strong on uh, um, uh, on human rights issue, but they don't understand that protesting without some cash as a real threat behind it doesn't help very much. And I'm afraid that if Baerbock gets the foreign ministry, she will learn it the hard way uh, that her uh, moral um, sermons uh, to Russia and China will not uh, um, uh, get uh, the answer that she perhaps expects. Thank you. Thank all three of you very much. Uh, as I can see in the Q&A uh, tab that I have open here, your, your remarks have already inspired lots of conversation uh, uh, across the campus at the very least. Uh, and I have lots of questions I wanna pick up on and you should feel very much free to sort of respond to the remarks that others have made before you. Um, but one question I wanna to pose to all of you that came up in the Q&A here, and I'll read it out, is the question of climate change, both as sort of a domestic policy issue as well as a foreign policy and security issue. Um, the specific question asked here by one of our audience members is, to what degree sort of climate change will be a topic in a coalition government that is formed uh, with the SPD and the pro-business free Democrats? Um, and to what degree it should be, right? And from what perspective the topic will have to be tackled by the German government? So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Meyer, do you wanna start us off to what your impression is on this? Well, I think regarding climate change, this could be like, um... I would say one of the of the major points that could um, lead to uh, further discussions in the coalition, because while it's one of the most most important topics for the green voters, like um like they also have for for the limitation of of, of on uh, well the limitation on on the autobahn. So because this is another important um, topic that always comes up for the greens. So I'm not sure um, where this will lead. Um, I I would say. I would um, assume that they would have some um, vague plans for the future, but nothing um, quite quite specific for the next four years. And I think this would lead um, would put a lot of pressure on the Greens because while the the non governmental organizations and like um, especially the Fridays for Future mo movement would probably heavily contest that, and this could open up some space like um, on the more greener side of the Greens. Um, so I think this has a lot of potential for for conflict, but I'm curious to hear what others say. Yeah, maybe if I if I may follow up. So first of all, on the climate change um, issue, I think 
I mean, this is this is a huge topic for the next German government. Quite honestly, um, climate change has already always been a big political topic in Germany, much more so than in many, if not most, other countries. But but still, more needs to be done, and the Greens, of course, very much ran on this. Um, I think, you know, as as Sabrina just said, you know, Fridays for Futures for Futures already criticizing the Greens in the coalition negotiations. We don't even know what's going to happen, and you're, they're already being criticized. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to be an opposition party and um, to focus very much on one issue and, and kind of drive the, the government um, uh, ahead of you and, and say, you know, you need to do more. And it's a completely other thing to be part of the government and actually having to make compromises with your coalition partners, but also just with, you know, reality and and, and realize that there's only so much you, you can do. So I think um, this isn't going to be that easy for the Greens because now they will need to deliver and Per definition, they won't be able to deliver as much as as they promised or would want to, or maybe is even needed. So there is there is a big issue there. Um, two very very short points, if if I may, just to number one, drive home one point that that Vittorio mentioned, which is this kind of um, problem again, primarily for the Greens, but maybe for the next uh, government in Germany more generally which is this element of you need to be really careful of adopting a more hawkish, confrontational, muscular, I don't really know how to how you want to call it, um, policy towards powers such as China and Russia on human rights if you then don't back it up with building up your own geopolitical power, which includes, for example, military power and, and economic power. And I'm slightly worried that Indeed, if we get, you know, a green foreign office, you may have like a big rhetoric, but not necessarily that much behind it. And that's not great policy. It's it's actually almost a bit dangerous, depending on how it goes. So so definitely something something to watch. Um, and just one final point also, because I saw it in the, in the Q&A, there were quite a few questions about the AFD and, and the CDU and all of this. And just just one thing I kind of disagree, I think, with Vittorio on on where the, the CDU should go. Um, I actually think that this election should have sent a message to the CDU that going further to the right may not be a great strategy. It is correct that, you know, for many years, the CDU said there shouldn't be a, 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 um, a party right to the CDU. Um, sure, if we could make this happen, that would be great. But if it meant actually adopting RFD positions, I don't think that that would be a good a good um a good outcome and i get increasingly the sense that for every you know vote you gain on the right you lose 10 or even 100 in the center and we've seen this uh, for example with a really controversial rather right wing candidate that the cdu in Thuringia put up um Maaßen, which i would say honestly should rather go to the afd and he lost even in East Germany. So, so I think the, the the CDU, you know, now has four years ahead of um, ahead where it needs to find a kind of new a new identity or kind of reaffirm its identity. But I'd be quite careful in moving too much or even a little bit to the right, given that German that's not where German society I think um, is is going. But there, are, you know, people disagree on on that. So we'll see. <laughs> Victoria, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I would like to say two things. Uh, first of all, I agree completely that the um, uh, a climate question will be an important question of the government and that the Greens will have difficulties because they will not be able to deliver all what they have promised. Um, on the other hand, I do think that even the Liberal Democrats have understood that the climate issue is the question of the future and that an ordo liberalism uh, ultimately must be expanded in such a way that the order which is not to be given to the market, but that allows the market to function properly, must contain also um, the saving of the environment. And so I do think that a lot of the discussions that have occurred also between the FDP and the Greens in the last uh, um, a decade um, make me more optimistic that uh, Germany will make steps forward in that discussion um, than uh, um, other countries. Uh, because in this area, I think the German population is indeed more advanced than other people, as Ulrike uh, was saying. With regard to the future of the CDU, um, of the CDU, um, um, if you want to use the um, English um, um, uh, names of the letters, uh, 
the question is complex, and of course, uh, they will have to sort it out um, in the next uh, years. Uh, and on the one hand, it's of course true that people prefer to vote for original. If in Thuringia um, you can vote for the AfD, why should you vote for Maaßen in the CDU? Um, uh, uh, the AfD became the strongest party in Thuringia, and if Maaßen had run in the AfD, it would have been much easier for him to be elected than in the, um, uh, in the CDU. People usually prefer the original to what they perceive as being an insincere copy. On the other hand, I do think that there are certain lasting conservative themes which the CDU will have to revitalize. Um, for example, a point where I think Dr. Frank and I are in agreement is the necessity of a military. Um, um, the um, uh, CDU was traditionally a party very much committed um, uh, to the armed forces. Let's not forget that the um, rearmament of Germany in the 1950s was done against the majority will of the population by Adenauer, uh, the first great CDU uh, chancellor. Um, so uh, another point where I think um, uh, the um, uh, CDU has a possibility um, uh, to regain conservative voters that have loped to the AfD. The AfD is the most shameless supporter of Russia in the German Bundestag. Um, it's very peculiar um, that uh, a conservative people, I grew up in Bavaria, uh, 40 miles from the Iron Curtain, and I confess that it is part of my cultural DNA that uh, I was afraid as a child of a possible Soviet invasion, um, uh, because the reality was not too far away. And the fact that a lot of conservatives uh, have sympathy for Russia is something that is not natural and the CDU could use, for example, um, uh, awareness of a necessity of uh, um, a strong European defense, and it's clear that Germany can only uh, defend itself within a European Union and within the NATO, and therefore an insistence on the transatlantic partnership uh, uh, may uh, regain uh, um, a people who have moved to the um, AfD. Just a very quick follow-up for uh, Dr. Franke uh, before we head over to some questions about the AfD and immigrant origin voters for uh, Dr. Meyer in the Q&A. So just sort of looking at the geopolitical landscape today, right? We, we sort of the, U, the EU and Germany within it is sort of awkwardly positioned, right? Transatlantic relationship is still going strong, at least according to some, right? Uh, at the same time, the Trump years were a little strenuous. Then you have Russia next door, and then you have China uh, uh, growing further away. What, what's the big threat here? Like, what's the what what what's the threat you would focus on, and what does that mean for what the German government should do? Yeah, I think that's the that's the 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 big multi-million dollar question, if you like. Um, I mean, I guess very big picture. Um, the 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 China question really is the big one. Uh, how how do we deal with a with the rise of China and China becoming the other superpower? Um, and I can very much see this here in, in Brussels. Um, Europeans are really struggling with this a bit and for good reason, because for the United States, the situation is relatively clear. If you are the one sole superpower and then there is another one rising, you try to keep it down. And I think that's a completely legitimate approach um, to things. Um, the thing is that for Europe, it's not quite the same situation. Yes, of course, you know, we're very clearly aligned with the United States. Um, it's a democratic country. We share most of our values with the United States. Europeans in general would prefer living uh, in a world dominated by the US, but we don't quite do, you know, power politics in the same way as the US does. It's not quite so clear that um, Europeans feel that they have the right of, of suppressing any kind of rising power. Um, they would definitely prefer uh, just kind of integrating China more in the international system. Now, this doesn't seem to be working, and the Europeans and Germans realize this, but 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 there's there's definitely a big question here. And the narrative, I think, is still that that Europeans and, and Germans will try to um, avoid a confrontation with China and avoid a confrontation between the US and China. I heard I heard the idea that Europe can maybe act as some kind of um, corrective, so kind of corrective force um, in this relationship. That's going to be super hard, um, and, and, and the US won't particularly like it in many instances, but, but I, you know, I, I kind of see the, the sense in this, because just 100% aligning with, with the US on, on the China question right now 
also strikes me as a little bit of dangerous. And again, don't get me wrong. Of course, Europe is aligned with the US on, on, on many, if not all, issues. So that's not the question. But we don't want to create a kind of third world war situation either. So we need to be we need to thread really carefully on that. So I think this is the one big thing we need to look at. However, this is the kind of big strategic threat for the next decades. At the same time, you know, we still have Russia um, on our borders and Russia is, is a really tremendous spoiler power. They're extremely good at kind of, you know, creating issues for everyone, creating frozen conflicts, pushing um, the buttons of NATO and the EU here and there, trying to create um, mayhem. And so, and so we can't just say, you know, Russia is declining, uh, China is more important, we don't care anymore. On the contrary, the more the US looks towards China, the more Europe and the EU um, will need to make sure that, that Russia is, yeah, to some extent contained. A lot of people say we need to talk more with Russia, we need to find solutions. I'm all for that, but honestly, it takes two to tango and there's nothing coming from the Russians. So I'm not going to say, yes, we need to find new communication channels with Russia because they don't want them. So, you know, there's only so much you can do. You can do with outreach. So, um, Europe and 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 this in this case specifically means Germany will need to step up its um, strategic and specifically military defensive capabilities. And um, as I was saying, this is already not something that's that's uh, popular among Germans in general, and it's certainly not something the next government is likely to be comfortable with. So that's going to be quite the quite the struggle. Excellent. Uh, and maybe so the last big topic area, and I'll start with Dr. Meyer here because this is your areas of expertise. We have had a lot of questions about both voters for the AFD as well as, well as this group of immig immigrant origin uh, uh, voters. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, who's voting for the AFD uh, uh, and who are those ir immigrant origin voters voting for and what sort of their, uh, what, what, you said, you know, no one really cares about them. They're not really a big topic, but but still, as you said, they're a, a very significant percentage of the electorate, right? So Maybe you can just shed some light on, on these issues for our audience since you have sort of the expertise in the area. Okay, so I start with the comment that actually there are mo more immigrant origin voters in Germany than first time voters. But first time voters get like a much more, uh, get a much bigger focus um, from the media. So this is still um, very interesting to see. So um, concerning the AFD and immigrant origin voters, I would start at the intersection because. Um, I think Germany has one peculiarity when it comes to their, their specific groups of immigrants, and we have Russian Germans, which is the term for um, so-called ethnic Germans whose ancestors migrated to the to Russian kingdom like uh, 200 and uh, more than 200 years ago, and who came back to Germany after the fall of the Iron Curtain for better life conditions. And this group is um, really, really specific um, with regard to certain characteristics. So often they had German as their home language, or at least their grandparents um, talk, talked in German. They had a lot of German traditions. And most of all, they have the sense like they are not immigrants. So it's not like they are coming by chance to Germany, but they have the right to be here because they are Germans, which is like a totally different self perception than the other groups, and which makes this group quite quite unique. I think there's there's not much uh, like this worldwide. I think there's the Piet Noir in, in, in France or probably ethnic Finns in Sweden. But this group um, is much more on the right. So um, in the 90s, they were strongly affiliated with the CDU and CSU because they were quite glad that Helmut Kohl brought them back to Germany. And also they share a lot of conservative values. So um, like two thirds of this group actually voted for the Christian Democrats. But I think beginning 10 years ago or such, um, the, the strong ties were vanishing. And, um, in the last election, so 20, uh, 2017, um, we saw that actually the Russian Germans have an overproportional share of AFD voters. So in the general population, we had 12.6%, but among the Russian Germans, we had 15 to 20%. So, um, Regarding the fact that actually an immigrant group is voting for an active anti-immigrant party, this might seem a bit puzzling at the first glance, but if you know the background that this group is actually um, considered um, ethnically um, being German, this makes sense. But coming to immigrant origin voters in generally in Germany, um, well, 
the group is highly heterogeneous, so we have a lot of different um, countries of origin, but the most important ones are, of course, uh, Russia or the Soviet Union and its successor states, but also Turkey and Poland. And among the other immigrant origin groups, we saw um, also in the 1990s that they were heavily affiliated with the SPD due to socialization by um, labor unions and, and because those, most of those migrants were labor migrants. And also those ties vanished. So in the last elections, there was a huge, I would say, individualization. So um, there's not much ethnic clock voting um, to see anymore, but people um, well choose from, from uh, all parties of the spectrum. We also have um, like a share of 20% of Turkish um, immigrant origin voters that now vote for the Christian Democrats, which is possible because the Christian and Christian Democrats is not as uh, well big as, as, as it was like um, 20 years ago. So um, we see now a quite, uh, I would say, diversification. And I also saw one of the questions regarding immigrant origin candidates, which is, of course, an interesting one because and um, we saw over the last five elections, rising share of immigrant origin candidates. Even the AfD put forward um, Russian Germans, of course, but also um, immigrants from, from Yugoslavia, for example. But in, in all other parties, we can also see um, um, much, much bigger shares of immigrant origin candidates. Of course, those candidates are often not put on the promising places on the party list, but um, do not have much chance for success. But still, those candidates are there. But um, immigrant organizations, or what we call Vereine, are usually not a part of the selection process because the selection process of the parties is quite complex. And usually it's, it's held within the parties. So um, there's, there's a lot of interesting work um, by a colleague, I can, can put this in the answer, who goes about the uh, selection process and its complexity, but it's often not um, done by, by the organizations or supported. Um, for the AFD, um, let's say um, when, when Ulrike said that, um, well, they lost a lot, uh, I, I understood where you, you, you were coming from, but still um, like those 10% feel so much to me because when they ended parliament, everyone told us that, well, after four years, this problem will have well solved itself because they will probably sabotage themselves. And they did. I mean, they hit so much in intra-party struggles. And I think the more they fail as politicians, the more popular they are at, uh, among some parts of the population. So I think this is um, something that, that needs to be um, looked at more in detail, because especially when we look at the East, first of all, in the former East, people are more open to um, nativism, which is the combination of anti-immigrant sentiment and um, nationalism. So we have higher shares of people with anti-immigrant um, attitudes in the East, per se, which is going back to the socialization and the GDR and its, its ex exclusionary view on foreigners. But we also see opportunity structures that are different. So um, the other parties do not have that many organizations there. And um, it's, it's simply missing. So And the AFD took over and took um, this, this gap and built up their own structures. And the question was, what could the CDU do? Well, I think what they could do is that they could at least try, because there are large parts of um, the former East where the AFD was one of the only parties that at least took an effort, that put up posters, that put up um, some sort of campaign activity. And other parties simply just um, did not try anymore, because there are only few party members in the East, and it seems not like like a place where they put in their resources. The only difference um, was mecklenburg Vorpommern, where the SPD and Manuel Schwesig put in a lot of resources and actually um, gained a lot. So this can be quite successful, but you have to try and you have to spend time and money and you, you have to consider this. Yeah, so um, that's from me. Awesome, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And I, I hate to, to cut off the discussion here because we're unfortunately running out of time. Um, I, all I can say is thank you so much for our three uh, distinguished guests today. It was it was a great pleasure. Um, all, and, and in addition, I would say check out their work. They all have uh, written extensively. They've all appeared extensively in the media. So if you want more information, you can learn from them even after this, uh, just by going on to Google. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, check out coming Nanovic events uh, in the coming weeks. And 
see you soon. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.